Hello, everybody. My name is Jacek Bartosiak. Uh, I represent strategy and future here. Uh, and my guess, uh, and, and you know, the interview that we are going to have is with uh, Velina Czakarowa. Uh, Velina, if you could just introduce yourself uh, so that you don't uh, you know, skip any important information. First and foremost, Jacek, thank you for having me uh, to this, uh, you know, inviting me to this very interesting intellectual debate that we are going to have. Uh, in the next 60 minutes, uh, my name is Elina Czakarova. I'm the director of the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy based in Vienna, Austria. And our think tank is dealing with uh, foreign security and defense related issues in Europe and in the world. Okay, nicely put. I, as I said, represent strategy and future would deal with great uh, power competition in Eurasia and around Eurasia, global politics and security. Uh, and this is like basically how sort of we met digitally with uh, Velina by uh, understanding that I think we shared uh, the, the similar mechanism of seeing uh, the world. Uh, and this is why we decided to have this conversation uh, so that our listeners could listen to what we think about the, the change that we see uh, across the world. So, you know, Velina, how is it all seen from Vienna? from Vienna on the Danube River. How do you see Europe uh, and the changes uh, around Europe uh, and this China-US thing and the role that Europe should play? Well, we start immediately with the uh, one million <laughs> dollar question because uh, as being at, you know, situated at the heart of Europe, uh, geographically seen, uh, Vienna has a really a great uh, geopolitical position on the old continent. Um, I have the luxury of uh, looking in all four directions and, uh, you know, uh, getting a feeling about what the East and what the West and what the North and what the South is right now, you know, um, uh, worried about or concerned with. And um, let's be honest about it. Uh, we, uh, in my view, are living in the most exciting times since probably the last 2000 years in terms of transformational processes. Now the whole world, not just Europe, is witnessing these profound transformation changes. And specifically when it comes to the geopolitical arena of international affairs, as you know, uh, Vienna was one of the places uh, during the Cold War, which witnessed uh, you know, all these um, kind of uh, interesting international actors being active. Uh, not just in terms of, uh, it might sound very exciting, in terms of, you know, the center of European center of spies, but it was also the case that due to the, you know, to the presence of so many international and regional organizations, we uh, had all these uh, relevant powers on the ground. So we could also sense the atmosphere, right? And right now, what I've been observing for the last at least several years, it's a similar situation where all relevant actors in the East also, the Dragon Bear, China, Russia, the Americans also, I mean, on the other side of the Atlantic, and of course the European powers are quite present uh, here in Vienna. And that is for me the signal that something is, you know, moving. And this kind of profound transformational processes that we are going to witness in the upcoming decade uh, I hope are going to be also somehow reflective here on the ground so that we can also make the proper analysis of them. And how, you know, and so what is your take on that? I mean, what is changing actually? What is, what is, the, what is the change and how we should analyze in which paradigm we should analyze those changes? Because, you know, but let me add one more thing. Mm -hmm. we, we sort of in Europe started to believe in the nineties that uh, there, there was an end to history and uh, suddenly within this European Union concept, we would navigate to the safe waters of the future, you know, prosperity. Mm -hmm. What got broken? What happened? Well, it didn't break necessarily, but I think that uh, right now what we are observing is a kind of a, is, is, is the punch in the, in, in, in the face by the real politic, which was actually more or less uh, one of the most prominent school, uh, schools of thinking uh, in the 19th century. And was, you know, for many reasons than 
forgotten or somehow you know neglected in the 20th century now it's coming back uh, so what we are observing at the systemic level of international relations is a kind of uh, you know transformation from a more or less unilateral um, you know system um, of the global affairs uh, towards uh, in my view um, more or less bipolar one uh, which will be centered around two powers, uh, you know, two centers of power, two main centers of power. Um, the um, second, uh, and that of course will, you know, will create uh, a lot of centrifugal forces, um, specifically at this regional level of middle powers. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, Europe, the European powers, but also India and other regional actors. And Russia is going to be one of these, you know, middle powers. Suddenly that will have probably much more uh, space to operate as a free ride, uh, right? So this is the one thing. The second, uh, you know, major change is of course that this kind of systemic bipolarity will unleash a lot of competition among the regional centers of power. And this is also something that we are now increasingly observing in the direct neighborhood of Europe to the south, but also to the east. And then of course, it's going to be once again, a systemic competition that will basically entail all relevant uh, socio-economic uh, systems uh, and networks, uh, which are meanwhile so interconnected with each other that, uh, you know, repercussions in uh, our economic or trade uh, system um, unleash, um, un, uh, you know, unprecedented uh, effects on, uh, for instance, on uh, diplomacy or on um, international organizations or on the global finance networks. So it's, everything is very, uh, inter, you know, very much interconnected. And that also means, of course, that we are going to observe kind of global supply chains reconfiguration. Everything is going to be bipolarized, bipolarized. And as a side effect of it, I expect that this kind of phenomenon that was, you know, was started with Trump, uh, with the make uh, America great again, is going to turn into make every country great again. Basically, each, you know, significant power will try to gain, to maximize its gains, to capitalize on this systemic competition between Washington and China, and we try to somehow navigate between between both you know, powers without necessarily taking sides, at least so long as possible. That's mm -hmm. my take. So, so sort of you imply that the nations uh, will be the, the most prominent actors and uh, they will be more opportunistic at the same time operating in the regime of zero-sum gain. So as it was always throughout the history and, and the dream of Fukuyama was only a short-lived uh, aspirational uh, thing. And so I think we share this opinion in Warsaw. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were getting ready for this, uh, for, the, for those times that we were thinking were coming. Uh, unfortunately, we, un we were underprepared uh, in terms, we, 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 we too much believed really in the 90s that the history had ended. And maybe yeah. because Poland was uh, stricken by history so hard that we really believed that the West is a cohesive unit and that the Western institutions and the modernization project would simply prevail over the global affairs. And that uh, in that respect, our foreign uh, policy was operating in the automated mode because the, the system, the global system based on the US primacy actually was taking care of all problems that we were facing in our neighborhood. So it was not us that were supposed to do something because the system operated uh, to our benefit, at least to a certain extent. And now things will change. Things will change. We, in Warsaw, we think that the main reason for the change is the rise of China. Uh, and of course, the Russian desire to s stabilize on their terms the, the neighborhood, the vicinity. And because Poland is actually in the critical Limitrov position towards Russia, we, we have had 19 wars with Russia in the history. Because of that, you know, we, we just feel a, a little bit uh, preoccupied. I mean, largely preoccupied by, by this fact. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what we think, though, is that um, 
you you said the two thousand years even the, the greatest transformation. I, I I used to in the public debate in Poland. I I used to I used to operate uh, along the three hole three hole uh, three uh, three thresholds that I had in terms of historical process. For sure, this is the greatest change since the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the systemic rivalry between China and US. I am also quite sure that this is the greatest change since this is the end of the second wall and the Bretton Woods, uh, Woods system creation. But I also argue that this is the greatest change since the, uh, the great, uh, the, the world ocean uh, revolution, since, you know, since the, 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 the navigators, the, the brave sailors of Portugal, Spain and France and England, moved out and ventured into the high seas and, and created the con connectivity to around Africa, to Asia and, and America, across the Atlantic, creating the, the sort of a new sinews of power, new connectivity that, by the way, contained Aust Imperial Austria and, uh, of course, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in the dual here in the landlocked Europe. Okay, And structurally, we're losing to... to and I think that the Chinese want to change, want, want to completely change the last 500 years of the history and uh, recreate the, the connectivity across the landmass of Eurasia and around the littler waters of Eurasia by controlling the strategic flows. And I will end here. Uh, and Poland is on the way, mm -hmm. as well as Austria. But Poland is on the, on the way as an opening sort of a player on the Northern European plane. We, with Ukraine, we monopolize strategic flows across the landmass of Eurasia, and that's why we had so many wars. This is our perspective in Warsaw. Mm -hmm. Well, that is quite fascinating because uh, Poland uh, doesn't have the luxury to not have a geopolitical you know, vision about the world because Poland knows very, very well, unfortunately, uh, what it means to be squeezed by not one but two powers and basically what is going to happen at the you know even bigger level unfortunately is and is still the, the realization about it is still not in place in the European capitals is that now that Europe is running the risk of being squeezed between two powers and basically without having the chance to you know not just navigate but actually you know being completely left left behind in terms of all you know indicators if you take them and if you compare them from for, for, for the last uh, hundred years but now going back to China before we moving to Europe um, is that I yes I agree with you first and foremost uh, about uh, you know China's um, idea some experts say that Chinese don't have you know, strategy, others say, no, that's strategic thinking, but actually no grand strategy. Uh, so I would put it as a, you know, connectivity vision for itself. And that is uh, that uh, Beijing is now in the unique situation to become basically the first, the first global power that will develop simultaneously uh, two, stra two connectivity strategies. Uh, it, it, it seeks to become simultaneously a heartland that means building terrestrial connectivities via Central Asia or the Great Eurasia to, of course, to the industrial heart in Europe and uh, a second terrestrial connectivity to with an access to the Indian Ocean and then simultaneously with it to actually establish control in its own rimland, which is then uh, the Indian um, you know, ocean region, the Indo-Pacific region. So basically the whole area which uh, entails the most significant choke points for food and uh, oil supplies. Now, if you, if you look at it, this has been achieved by any other, you know, power in the last uh, 200, 200, 250 years. I mean, the Great Britain, if we take the Great Britain and then we take the United States as the two examples, from the last uh, cycles of globalization, technological revolutions and connectivity of the global affairs, this will be really unprecedented. And I think that China stands good chance to do it. And that is actually the big risks for those uh, which will have to face, you know, uh, a power which will be, you know, operate in these two 
um, in these two uh, major geoeconomic and geopolitical scopes and uh, spaces. And if you look at how we are going to actually counterbalance this, like how, where are we going to build a counterweight to this kind of rise? Uh, you know, um, on the one side, it looks, it seems to me that there is already a certain effort on the side of the United States as this rimland, you know, country, uh, if we base our premises on the, you know, on the theories of uh, Nicholas Pikeman and uh, Mackinder, uh, that they are now trying to establish a kind of an Anglo Anglosphere, Anglosphere network of countries that will engage China mostly in the in the rimland, right? I mean, take the South China Sea, take the Indian Ocean, take the you know the the Straits, and all these kind of uh, you know all these kind of uh, important terrains at, along the maritime routes. Now, the maritime routes, which still witness more. Of, I think 90% of global trade, right? And like I said, all the global choke points are uh, along them. Now, they are still very much controlled by the United States. So that's why we should also keep an eye on these terrestrial connectivities that you've mentioned, because this is where, for instance, Poland or Austria or all these middle, you know, Central European countries in this very classic understanding of Mackinder. Uh, comes uh, to the fore, come to the fourth, right? Because uh, you know, having control over Central and Eastern Europe would give an access to this uh, kind of you know heartland uh, terrain, which will then actually enable a control, or let's put it that way, global power projection. And this is where now this kind of connectivity projects, like I said, meanwhile two parallel terrestrial connectivities. Uh, one via Russia and the Russians, I mean, they have this kind of geopolitical uh, thinking and uh, they s seized the opportunity in 2014 following the isolation by the West to basically um, reorient themselves toward China because they knew they need this, right? Uh, not in terms of uh, economic gains so, so much, but in terms of this kind of message that they are sending now to the world that we can actually actually do something to counterbalance the US uh, you know, global influence. And then the second one is, in my view, e equally, equally worrying. And that one is you know, the terrestrial connectivity um, via Central Asia, and then moving to Black Sea, you know, Southern Caucasus. And now Turkey is of course also a player which wants to capitalize on this. And this will actually increase the pressure coming from China on Eastern Europe and on then of course on Central Europe. So one to finish this is one way how I see that there might be a certain you know, logical reaction on the side of Central European um, countries is you know, to build alternative connectivity projects. And this is something that for instance, Poland is right now doing. And yes, on the side of Austria, there is still not so much interest, but I think that this is going to happen at some point. It's for instance, this kind of uh, you know, alternative connectivity, connecting the North to the South and the Mediterranean and then North Africa, which is very much promoted by the United States, but also I think European institutions are going to you know, support it. Um, and this kind of, you know, this kind of, alternative connectivity projects in terms of infrastructure, transport, energy routes are inevitable to happen. It's just a matter of time in my, in my view. Yeah, but, but it is very interesting what you're saying because we really share the Central European perspective with this, uh, you know, with this uh, enhanced, sort of enhanced interest towards uh, landlocked connectivity. Because I, I have a few remarks to, to what you said. First of all, I, I have been seeing in Washington DC and across the United States since 2013, when I was really, I was really engaged in RC battle concept in Washington and sort of understanding that Raja, China's in rise and so on. But I, I still, and even judging from your conversation with Edward Ludwig that was recently published, I, I see that there is a sort of a really miscalculation on, on parts of Americans. I, I, they don't understand the, the racial domain. 
they don't, as a people of, you know, maritime domain, they don't understand the terrestrial connectivity. They, 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 silly, they really lack the level of uh, sophistication, even, so to speak. And this is really scary. It scares me a lot. Uh, but I, I will ask you for what do you, what do you think about it, but, uh, but let me add a few remarks. And the second thing is that um, connectivity is the name of the game because that creates supply and value chains. And then that creates sinews of power and leverages and anti-leverages and so on and so forth. This is a competition, especially in a zero-sum game. And especially if there is no hegemon, one hegemon that is, um, and the China is on rice, uh, no, no doubt. The problem with Poland and the connectivity is um, many, manifold. By the way, I was the CEO of this project, the largest project in the history of the region. Uh, you know, Solidarity Transport Hub, Central, you know, probably you heard about it in, in mm -hmm. Warsaw. I was a CEO of that and one of, and one of the team, the people in the team that designed it. It was all about geopolitics. And it's still, we wanted to create the... Um, the problem is that Poland lies on the east-west uh, connectivity line where the troops usually marched. And the greater powers uh, uh, want to create their own rules of the game to organize the strategic flows across the terrain, movement of people, goods, technology, data, troops, and so on. And if we want to control our own uh, future, we can allow it, okay? And this is why we're so happy about the US dominance in the system. Historically, Poland was a, 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 a prosperous country when we had connectivity north and south, not east and west. But of course, after the communist uh, times, we wanted to join the West, so created connectivity and we became the subcontractor of the German economy and Germans have their own Mittel Europa concept in place. Uh, in a way, we are happy about it. In a way, we are not happy about it because it provides, of course, modernization effort. It provides money, people have money. We have growth and Poland prospers, that's true. But at the same time, Poles are weird. We used to be the original empire. So we have all those concepts, you know, of being an independent player. Actually, this is why the world started in 1939, because we really thought that we could balance the game. <laughs> okay, so that was a miscalculation on our part. But so this, that's why we are a hybrid country in a way, because we economically, we are rather weaker than everybody else, but in our in designs, and uh, sort of a um, space that we need to politically control to feel secure is much greater than our capacity. So it has always been a, a very difficult proposition, you know. Uh, that's why we are always so nervous in the European Union, you know, we are always the most um, naughty boy in the class, you know, and th this, is, this, this is how it works. So we wanted to create North-South connectivity and connect to Romania to, 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 to sort of uh, connect up to the Danube River system to the Black Sea, connect North Baltic, Baltic Sea and, uh, and uh, Black Sea, and also to connect our Eastern buffer zone uh, of the old Commonwealth, Belor Belarusian you know, territory and Ukraine, and connect to our center of gravity in Warsaw. Okay, because geographically it's doable. It's doable and it used to be like that. Partitions by Austria, Germany and um, and uh, Russians destroyed it, okay? And we, and we still are halfway to sort of restore the process. So connectivity is a game. And let me end also this part of, of, uh, of, of our conversation by saying that the Chinese were pounding us since 2015, and they understood in detail our connectivity problems, geography, Mackinder, Mahan, Spikeman. I met them personally and uh, I find it completely ludicrous that the, some people, some scholars in the West say that Chinese don't crowd strategy. I mean, I think we should catch up. Mm -hmm. This is my personal observation. We should catch up, not they, in my personal opinion, uh, in understanding. We, I think we went to sleep in the 90s and they, and they just woke up, right? Just like Mahubani claims in his uh, new book. Oh yeah, absolutely, and um, I concur with your view. I uh, 
stated already in 2015 that uh, this has been the great geopolitical over, I mean, we've completely overslept this kind of shift in the thinking and in the, you know, in the thinking and in the doing. And uh, it might not look like a one grand strategy or like a comprehensive um, strategy or approach. And we've lost so many years debating each other within Europe, but also with our American colleagues, that there is no strategy behind, for instance, Belt and Road, and then later on uh, BRI, right? So we basically lose so much time to actually <laughs> debate each other on issues that are irrelevant in the um, context of the, big, of the big picture. And like you said, uh, connectivity is the great game. So I think that if there is one, specifically one, um, you know, region in Europe which will capitalize on this great shift in terms of thinking about connectivities, because like I said, it's all, not just about, you know, transport or about, you know, energy, but also, you know, infrastructure. This is going to be central in European Europe. Uh, this is going certainly going to be, you know, one of the regions I think that are going to face further pressures for obvious reasons, but are, can also capitalize if prepared properly, if, of course, and mostly if in a coordinated manner. Either at this single place, the single games are not going to work out well for us here in Europe, like I said. And one of the reasons is that all European powers are small in the, in the, in the context of the great powers competitions. It's just that, like, I've I, I forgotten who said that, but uh, as someone said, it's just that some of the European powers haven't realized it yet. Sure. But in the context of the great powers competition, we are all small powers here on the old continent. Um, we have one geoeconomic actor, that is the European Commission, that is the only body that can really be on par with the United States and China. When it comes to negotiating complex trade deals, that's the reality. But, and let me be very, very clear about it, the European Union and its institutions cannot be a geopolitical actor. We cannot expect for, from bureaucrats to play the role of a geopolitical actor. What we can do in a concert, of course, among the European powers is how to actually bundle this geoeconomic potential that we still have, so long as we have it, so that we actually derive from it a geopolitical potential and use it for you know, those spaces that we still have you know, the capabilities and uh, you know, the, the capabilities to, to shape. And that is the reality. And let me give you one example. I mean, there has been a lot of discussion about the uh, in, you know, investment deal with China. I mean, in reality, it was the right thing to do. It was just a very unfortunate timing. It was very unfortunate timing. It, it gave a lot of strategic clout, unnecessarily, but in the greater context of geoeconomic, uh, you know, um, projection, power projection, it was the right thing to do. It was done one, one, uh, you know, in a very, you know, in a very, in a very improper way, you know, bad timing, unprepared, you know, the Chinese uh, used the, you know, the opportunity that we were in time, in, you know, in, in, uh, in a Christ, Christmas festivity mood and there were no, you know, no bureaucrats or, you know, people who were, you know, looking at the texts and also we still don't have any idea about the texts, to be honest, in the European capitals. A lot of, you know, a lot of bullet points to be covered, but uh, in the great context, we still have this power through the negotiation, you know, capabilities of our European institutions, we should use it. We should so use it, but we cannot project it. So you, you are close to Germany, you know, by, 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 by language, so to speak, and Austria, you know, I mean, Österreich uh, at the end of the day is much closer to Germany than Poland. So what is the debate in Germany regarding this, this deal with China? What, what are the um, 
uh, cons and pros and uh, why did the Germans sign the bait? I mean, why did they push for signing? What is your opinion? Well, I can only present you with my reading. I, of course, I can tell you what uh, the German media is saying and what German politicians, leading G German politicians saying, but maybe... I your, should, reading, your reading is the most interesting for me. I should present you my reading, which is very neutral in a sense that I'm just looking at all these uh, events and uh, processes in a very emotionless way, trying to apply the rationale of Realpolitik, and that's all, you know, um, just to clarify it. And my reading is that, uh, you know, the Germans were in a hurry to do it because there is going to be a shift of the German leadership in uh, this year. Uh, you know, there's going to be elections, uh, the chancellor is going to be elected. That means, of course, probably also a shift in the German uh, politics um, towards China. That was one, one thing, I think, uh, this kind of rush to go back to normality, if we can put it that way, if you like, for business, for German industry, because German industry is still very much, you know, expecting a lot from, you know, from the bilateral relationship between Germany and China. So this kind of um, rationale of going back to business, going back to normality, I think is going to backfire very, very soon. Because nothing is going to be, you know, is going to look or uh, be the way it was prior to COVID-19. But that is the reading, that is their rationale, that is their expectation. They need the profits because also of the repercussions of, uh, you know, the COVID-19 crisis. So it's this short-term oriented thinking, more or less. I think this was, and then of course to, you know, send a, you know, signal uh, because, you know, who knows what the Americans under the new administration will come, come up with as a proposal and then I suppose that there was also the understanding that if they wait for the new U.S. administration, uh, you know, to set the agenda uh, for, you know, for the transatlantic partners, there's not going to be any space for, you know, for any deals. And if we look at the reactions coming from Washington, from the close circle of Joe Biden, this was basically the reading, right? So it was already clearly, uh, pretty clear that, uh, you know, the um, advisors of Biden were not very happy with what was going on, uh, on uh, you know, in terms of bilateral relations. So I think that this was also one of the rationals to do it now, because later we won't have any possibility to do it any longer. My, my reading is completely based on uh, real politics. And I think that the Europeans made a good decision in that respect in terms of the balancing game, because uh, the Americans treated the Europeans over the last three years as a junior partner, actually the, the, the weaponizing the, you know, it's hegemony, uh, dollar system, sanctions and so on. And actually, but breaching the uh, Crow Memorandum from the beginning of the 20th century uh, of the British diplomat who said that, you know, if you want to keep the system open as a maritime hegemon, you cannot sanction the other parties because they will ally against you. And actually, this is what happened subconsciously. Maybe even they didn't read the mem Crow Memorandum in Berlin, in Berlin, but they wanted to have all options on the table with the new administration coming. They didn't want to restrain their options. And this is the basic definition of real power, of the great, of real politics. Mm -hmm. Aside the values, I mean, too, mu too much discussion about values. You, it's always about options and maneuverability of options, and uh, this is what they did, and they leveled the playing field. Now the Americans will, will need to talk to the Europeans, and the Chinese will need to talk to the Europeans, and the Europeans may say that it will be rati we will be ratifying for two years. I don't know what's going to happen. So you keep the options on the, uh, in your hands. Exactly, you keep the and, options on the table. But at the same time, I, I hope that finally those this dreaming about values-based system will collapse in that, because that created a lot of. Uh, a lot of frustration across the Western world. And, uh, uh, you know, what, what, Paul's think, what, what Paul's think now is that, uh, of course, there is a shock of this because of the signing, because we really wanted the US to be in Europe. Right? But the problem is that, uh, 
And of course, in the ideal world, it would be great if Europe could be a, a great power, but it takes a lot of stuff to add to become a great power and uh, really stabilize this perimeter. We Europeans would need to have a power projection and negotiate the space with Russia, with Africa, with Turkey, with even with the United States, because the United States can penetrate the European peninsula however and whenever it wants. That was to Poland's benefit, but I'm not sure if it's to France, French benefit or Italians or Germans in that respect. So, but, I mean, but penetrating by, by political leverage. So this is the fundamental question about the future of Europe. And the Germans will need to make this decision. And Poles will be watching. Will be watching, watching closely. If Germans make a decision to create an empire and have this, uh, finally, this Hamilton's moment, uh, also with signing with, uh, with uh, China, then the Eurasian landmass will, will be created. But Germans will need to make sure that the Eastern perimeter is secured and Germans will need Poland as an ally to do it. Because the balance of power, the sh there will be a shift of balance of power across the European peninsula from France eastwards because of the German supply, supply chain, which makes better profits in the east, in Poland and Romania. Uh, and uh, France will lose. So those, all those forces that since the, the, the fall of the Roman Empire never allowed for the Europe to become a one empire will be playing against this scheme. Fascinating times. Mm -hmm. so, so let me put one more sentence. Either in 20 years time, we'll end up as a sort of united organism, confederated, maybe not federate, but confederated, pl playing as an actor with the power projection capabilities and Germans will need to pay for that because they, they have made a lot of profit out of the system over the last 30 years. Or we will be a forgotten place as China became in the 19th century, played against by China and Russia and United States with no modernization project. A place that used to be a dream place and stopped being a dream place because of demography, lack of modernization and lack of connectivity. We are at the crossroads in Europe. That's my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that... Um pretty much overlaps uh, with my scenarios for Europe, with my macro outlook for Europe. Right now, I'm more inclined to think that we are moving towards uh, my fragmentation, great fragmentation mind scenario. That means we are going to observe fragmentation lines created along the geopolitical and the geoeconomic uh, interests of uh, of relevant external actors on the old continent. And I don't only mean rivals and competitors such as China or Russia but, uh, or Turkey, but I also mean partners such as for instance, United States, um, you know, cherry picking also their partners, their most loyal partners, their most loyal, you know, uh, allies. I think that, uh, that at least that's my call. And I think that these fragmentation lines are going to get deepened because uh, it creates this kind of scenario, creates a lot of uh, incentives for the external actors to operate on the ground, first and foremost. Second, uh, it creates, uh, you know, it opens spaces to operate. Third, what is really very worrying is that they can also bundle forces, such as the case, for instance, with Russia and Turkey, the rapprochement, um, but, uh, you know, uh, even though that they are still very much, you know, sharing very conflictual interests, many issues, but when it comes to Europe, interestingly, they have quite, you know, quite, uh, quite uh, idea, you know, good ideas as to how to shape, for instance, uh, certain neighbor neighborhoods and certain, you know, certain uh, terrains. And, um, you know, if you look at uh, Turkey, how it has penetrated Eastern Europe, the near abroad of Russia without, without anything, you know, to happen to them, basically, more or less, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, I've been 
making this call for at least the last five years that Russia has been continuously losing influence in its direct neighborhood in Central and Eastern Europe. However, it, had all, it has also managed to solidify the shrinking influence. So this shrinking influence uh, on, you know, on the ground has been you know, facilitated, has been solidified, strengthened, but it has you know, been sh constantly shrinking. And that is something that as a trend hasn't been read correctly by many experts. You know, pointing to they, they are, you know, more assertive and more, you know, competing. No. And the very fact that now they are actually sharing a common, you know, a common space with Turkey in Salt Caucasus. Uh, Turkey is, uh, you know, looking for access to the Caspian, uh, to the Caspian Sea and then for the, to the Central Asia. And then, of course, you know, uh, basically trying to turn around the terrestrial connectivity of China so that it has placed itself strategically before they are, the Chinese start operating, you know, on a daily basis. Because it's coming, more or less. It's just a matter of time. So I think that this kind of scenario is more, you know, realistic for now. Um, I'm not convinced, to be honest. I, 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 of course, welcome all the great initiatives being launched by the European uh, institutions. However, as someone coming from, you know, from a system um, that has been pretty much ruled top down um, by a lot of bureaucrats, I'm not convinced that this is the way how we will actually come out with something fresh when we will adjust to the to the challenges of the time. We need uh, something very unorthodox. I don't think that just, you know, pouring liquidity into projects, into trillion world projects, top down is the way, is the only way to do it. It's going to be much more needed on our side here in Europe in order to, you know, to, to move on and to really come out of, uh, of, of this very risky second scenario, which was your first scenario, actually, which really worries me most, because, um, um, well, I have some proposals, of course, but I think that the, the realization that each European power has to do everything, <laughs> basically, each, each European power, each European member state has its vision about everything that concerns the European Union and our role in the world, right? So we know each, each member state, now 27 ha has an idea about each single policy in each single field. And I share, I don't share this view. I think that we should split, finally split roles and admit to itself, I mean, to, the, to, to ourselves, that we cannot deal it, I mean, with it that way. What do I mean? We should actually find out which are our probably two to three functional strengths, like one organism. I understand very well that each member state wants to be the heart and the mind of this great project, but it's just not the way how it works. And if you look at the human body, each single organ has exactly one very specific role to play, and you cannot remove any of these organs. So each organ plays an equally important role for the whole. So long as we don't understand this, we are going to move with this very tragic you know, pace, basically, you know, muddling through, doing something, debating each step. Anything that is proposed right now is being debated for years instead of doing something. And one final point, I mean, this functional, split of roles, I think is something that will demand a lot of courage, is very unorthodox, <laughs> but think about it. Do you really want to have a, for instance, European Union, Russia, Russian, you know, policy being shaped by the Spaniards? Or do you really want, I mean, I suppose that the Italians don't want to have, you know, Mediterranean policy in the southern neighborhood being shaped uh, by the Estonians, for instance. So what do you think? How, how should the roles be split? And who, is, who should be in charge of that? Uh, well, first and foremost, I think geographically, it's very obvious that we should 
lead, you know, have at least one, two leaders uh, in terms of regional, you know, priorities, regional prioritization. For us, for Europe, the regional prioritization is clear. We have three direct neighborhoods that will be contested in the upcoming decades. The Arctic, the Eastern and the Southern neighborhood are going to be contested by many, not just by one or two, but, but, but many will going to try to penetrate and use the space for their own gains. I mean, look at the North African space. It's not just, it's not just about the Americans or the Chinese or the Russians. I mean, meanwhile, it's about the Gulf states and it's about the Turkey and it's about India. Even India is trying to somehow, you know, uh, arrive. So we need, for instance, if we take the Southern neighborhood, we cannot move on if we have geopolitical clashes between the French and the Italians. Mm. And the very same thing happens in the Eastern European neighborhood where we have you know, a clear vision where we stand on Russia. But then again, we have some, you know, some European powers uh, that are still trying to capitalize on geoeconomic gains leaving aside the geopolitical uh, constraints, right? So it's not going to work that way. Yes, this is why the future of Europe is looks bleak, because it's going to be very difficult to del deliver cohesion. Let me give you an... That's why I'm pessimistic, although I like Europe. Uh, let me give you an example from my Polish soil. Who is going to run the policy towards Russia? French? President? So Poland, okay, so there is one interest that is non-negotiable non with Pol Poles. For the last 500 years, the, the most, I mean, the, actually the, the most important factor of our grand strategy was to keep Russia out of the cis European system. And we succeeded for the most part of this period of time. With the first partition, we lost. And then there was a seventh war, seven, seven, seven years war and the Napoleonic Wars. Russia became important for balancing efforts of other countries. And Russia was invited either by Germans, Prussians or French or English to play the balancing game against another. We regained independence when Russia lost the, the, first, the war against Germans in the First World War, and then lost its social cohesion during the revolution, and because they were defeated by the Polish troops in 1920 in the war. And then they were out of the system for 20 years. When they were back in the system, that they could be used as a leverage against another nation's interest, they were they signed the Continental Pact between Ribbentrop and Maud. And they were again, and Yalta and Posta. With the demise of the Soviet Union, they were again out of the system and we regained independence along with our Eastern buffer zones countries. And because Russia cannot provide any prosperity, any civilizational you know, aspect, what they do, they want to contribute and become a factor in the European system by leveraging the military power in the new generation warfare with this versatile system of, you know, intimidation pressure. And, Fran and France bought it because they need Russians to, to balance Turkey, mm -hmm. to think, to dream about connectivity to China. So President Macron dares to come to my region and talk over our heads. So this is, a, this is the message that I want to send out. Poland didn't block it because for the last 30 years, we have exercised strategic constraint, believing in the cohesion of the West. But here on the ground, we have the leverage to make things impossible for the French. If it really comes to the real great, you know, oh, hardball play, hardball play, okay? We are neighbors of Ukraine and Belarus, okay? We have had 19 wars with Russia. And right now, after the Belarusian crisis since in August, we are moving to a new phase. We already are abandoning the dream 
of the cohesion of the West, and there will be a new strategy of Poland. We will get ready for the new generation warfare and to negotiate the Eastern perimeter with Russia and the escalation ladder. And uh, if Germans understand that, they will join. But we'll never abandon this policy. That's, uh, that's how it is. And what I'm saying is that it's very difficult. If, if there is really to be one uh, Europe, mm -hmm. France will need to abandon its ambitions because it's in a bad place on the European continent and it doesn't have sufficient leverage. So it's going to be very difficult to deliver because the French will never accept it. I think that they will come to terms, the French, because they are not that power from the, you know, from previous centuries that can, you know, cope with the complexity of the global affairs nowadays. They are quite challenged in their own, you know, geopolitical space in the South uh, and need help. So obviously they are no longer, you know, doing this alone, but in a concert with also, you know, the help of uh, European, uh, European missions and other European partners and also international partners, just to give you one example. They came to terms also at to the realization that, you know, the Mediterranean, which was basically, you know, take Libya, for instance, was actually Italy's priority, more or less. Uh, you know, it led to this kind of unnecessary clash between the two uh, European, you know, uh, European members. And at some point they will realize that uh, it leads to nothing. It leads to nothing. It leads to um, basically lose-lose game because the rest of the actors won't wait. We'll, we'll not wait, you know, for them to come along, but we'll use this vacuum to, you know, fill the gaps. And then again, of course, this, I think, crush, you know, I think that's, like I said, all only my personal reading. I think that this rapproch so-called rapprochement by the French, as you said, was more or less initiated, uh, you know, by these constraints and, uh, you know, um, personal personal calls uh, to cope with Turkey specifically. That's why they, th they thought that they, if they go to, you know, to, to, to Moscow, they will somehow manage uh, this relationship. But then again, because you gave the example with a very, very, you know, com complicated relationship between Poland and Russia, and you say never, and I always, you know, as a, you know, as a geopolitical expert, I always tend to <laughs> remind ourselves of uh, the word never. Because um, if you look at what happened with Turkey and Russia, and you go back to the history of these two powers, you know, they, this have been two empires being engaged in so many, so many bloody wars on the Balkans and in Eastern Europe and everywhere. And they still somehow have managed to, you know, to cope with each other. So I think that there is no, never a, a kind of a never situation. And why I'm saying this now from a systems analyst's point of view, I found very striking what Edward uh, Lutwak said in, in, in our conversation about, about uh, Russia's role as a free rider uh, in the global affairs, because now, you know, roles have switched. At some point, even though that they are now engaged in this kind of systemic coordination, with China, that uh, the so-called dragon bear, which really worries me, specifically when it comes to defense, uh, cooperation, uh, you know, know-how transfer, things that the Russians might want to give to the Chinese, you know, in order to help them build a kind of, uh, you know, counterbalance to the Americans. These things really, really worry me and uh, have been worrying me for the last seven years. Now, I think that, uh, and this is what he said, I mean, we should never underestimate that, the, yeah, that they have been, you know, trying this already in, the, in, in previous episodes. And you mentioned uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, pact, but as soon as it got really, really messy, they, cho they chose the right yeah, side. I, so I agree. He said, he said that in terms of military if this competition between the Chinese and the Americans starts, you know, uh, becoming more volatile and tense and threatens to, you know, turn into a military conflict, 
Uh, he said that uh, actually he would not exclude the possibility that Russia would join, you know, once again, yeah, once United again States. the West. Yes, but of course, until reaching this uh, important threshold, it's always be it's 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 just in the nature of this geo, you know, political actor to disrupt. They don't create alliances. Of course, they Valina. disrupt alliances. I I agree, and so, we we realize that in Warsaw. We realize this. Actually, we think that it's quite probable that there will be a reverse Nixon move. Because I think the United States is going to lose the war in the littoral waters of the Western Pacific if China, if Russia is not uh, pressing on the continental domain against against China. So let's be realistic about it that uh, so long as we are not in this, because you also asked me what will move European powers into, you know, more kind of strategic thinking or splitting of roles. I think what will uh, be the case? Strategic necessity once it, it gets really, really hot in the, in the, in the direct neighborhood. I know, Valina, I, I agree, but this yeah. is a threat to Poland and our countries in the East because Russia will want something in a bargain. And Absolutely. This, uh, so it's and, not going and, to be a gift. It's not going to be uh, for granted. It's going so to be... This is why I said never, because we will never accept it. And that will be a great change. And we, that, we, we, did, we exercised that already. I mean, we experienced that before. So, um, uh, so this is this is a game on this Eurasian, uh, you know, uh, chessboard. But uh, to say that we don't have options is something that is quite, for me, also quite interesting. As a, you know, in terms of uh, uh, how um, you know how easily we give up on ourselves. Uh, um, even if you look at the intellectual debates uh, nowadays, I think. They, they have been, I think, even uh, coming from Poland uh, proposals, what can be done in order, for instance, to provide, uh, you know, more sophisticated, um, um, you know, military power, because let's be honest, we cannot, uh, why we cannot derive geopolitical clout from our geoeconomic power yeah. projection well, because, and this is also something that Lutwak uh, exemplified very well. I mean, you, as a power, as a great power, you can decide to, you know, stick to your diplomatic cloud, make some nice deals, be respected by all the rest of, you know, international players. But without the military cloud, and this is the case with Europe, we are not going to, you know, we are not going to sit on a negotiation table. And my proposal in that matter is because I'm not convinced that the way how we are doing this right now is going to be fast enough, efficient enough. I'm not saying it's not good. It's at least it's something. But it's once again this very European way of doing things that is, you know, very much 20th century like. But we are in the 21st century. We are in this great acceleration. We have to do things once again in a very unorthodox way. If we have a trend, and it's a very obvious trend of, you know, of um, emerging security, uh, private security companies, and we know that, and we've seen what is happening in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, and in other, you know, uh, conflicts. So we should think how we can actually build a military unit that is probably not situated within the you know, uh, common security and defense policy, is not bureaucratized. We do not need more bureaucratized initiatives. We need initiatives where powers that want to do, can do. Okay, so one probably, one possible way is just to think about something like public-private partnership. Create, why not creating our own, you know, um, European battle unit that is actually um, deployable in only, let's say, two or three regions and with only a strict mandate. But then we have like, you don't have a bureaucracy behind it and you don't need two uh, years, you know, to agree on it. You just pick on the countries that want to, to participate. And then you say it's a, on a voluntary basis for, uh, you know, soldiers from all member states, but also from all associated states, because countries like Ukraine or Georgia, 
are going to, you know, I mean, people from these countries are going to uh, participate in this kind of units. And then you have like Southern and Eastern neighborhood and you can deploy this unit quickly without all these discussions and all these kind of, uh, you know, all these uh, debates. And then of course, one might say, yeah, but uh, we, once again, because of our values, we cannot promote uh, mercenaries concepts, right? But uh, then again, if we act based on our values and try to survive in such a volatile environment based on our, va uh, on our values, nobody will respect these values. Sure. The values that we have, we should strengthen them and we should, we should protect them in words within our community. This is, these are our values within our big European family. These are our values, which we should not project them onto the outside world. We should operate in a very volatile world in which we operate the way how the others operate. That means we strive for survival and we have one common goal. This is one thing I think where all the European powers will agree on, small, medium and big ones. And that is that we don't want to be squeezed in these great power competitions. We want to protect our place there. That's true. I fully agree with your comments about the real punch and that the values are underpinned by power. So and first, not the other way around. Not the other way not, around. Not the other way around. And it's time to wake up. And this is why Poland, I think, is moving to the direction of creating its own force that will be capable of fighting the new generation warfare in the East. And we are waiting for the final outcome of the internal divide in Europe. Whether it's a transatlantic world with the US being here and supporting the Polish military effort of negotiating space with Russia, or it's a German-centered Europe uh, without US because US might be in decline, whatever. And then Germans will need to pro uh, project power, I mean, to, to help us build the force yeah in the East and Poland will be ready to do it, by the way. I think that not, not, not all the members of the European Union can say something about it, but Poland will be ready to spend money and feel the force to do it. And we are ready to do oh, it. Oh yeah, and you will find like-minded countries for sure, because you're not the only one which is now planning to increase uh, military I mean, defense budgets and uh, you know enhance military capabilities. There are other players in Europe, which are also interested in that matter. And uh, like you've put it, I mean, with uh, my, my anticipation for, uh, for Biden's administration is that it's going to be like, uh, specifically when it comes to the global players, it's going to be very much like, you know, Obama 3.0 institutional approach towards China, probably good weather policy, warming up. I wouldn't even exclude the kind of a institutional entanglement you know, so, going so, back to... So that means that the United States is going to lose the competition with China if uh, things don't change. Because the in my opinion, current trajectory is uh, benefiting China. And the major disruption would need to happen for the United States to have a chance to win. And even with this disruption, it is not certain. Mm -hmm. It's late. It's very late. And for all those that will be listening to us, uh, as they were listening to Edward Lutpak, Americans really are in denial, psychological state of denial. It's not, China is not the Soviet Union. China is a power horse of global economy, the main manufacturing actor on the, on the planet Earth, connected from Eurasia to everybody across the mainland, across the maritime routes. It's very difficult to contain the beast in this way. And not to forget, not to forget that there are very powerful players within the American establishment that are still very much interested in doing business with China. Of course, plus there are digital yes. empires of the West and the Let's Wall face Street. the reality. Yeah. So this kind of decoupling uh, is, uh, you know, like uh, is, is linked to uh, withdrawing symptoms. On the one side, you do realize you yeah. need it if you want to stay alive. <laughs> yeah. On the other side, you cannot get rid And that is the reality. This is what Mackinder uh, called the going concern. 
it's very difficult to change the course of a ship because there are so many vested interests that create the, 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 the balance between labor and capital that it's very difficult to disrupt them because they're going to kill you. So, uh, and this is the, what we are facing now in the West. If, we, if the West really wants to confront China, why the Chinese are very good in, in controlling this. Very good at controlling it. We will see how it, um, how it develops. Um, I think it's high time we finished, yeah, Valina. Maybe I will uh, sort of uh, try to tempt you to have another conversation sometime soon. Uh, Valina Czakarowa, Jacek Bartosiak, uh, Vienna, Warsaw. Uh, and uh, stay with us. I hope you enjoyed and uh, Let's maybe let's Valina do it one more time in uh, in the future. Thank you very much. That was a conversation about the future of Europe and a great power competition and everything that people dealing with strategy like to, to listen to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me with great pleasure.